And joining us now on the debate in Calgary, Alberta, David Collier, president of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. In the nation's capital, Christopher Smiley, senior advisor, government relations and public affairs for the Canadian Building Trades, and Jeffrey Simpson, national affairs columnist of the Globe and Mail, and with us here in studio, Keith Stewart, climate change and energy campaigner with Greenpeace Canada. Keith, good to have you back in the studio again. And to our guests on the line, we're thankful for your participation tonight as well. David, I want to start with you because uh, we just want to get the background straight here for those who haven't followed this project from the beginning. The pipeline would link Alberta to Texas for what purpose? Well, the purpose of this pipeline is to expand access uh, to U.S. Gulf Coast markets for Canadian producers. So it extends the pipeline network further south than it would otherwise be and allows Canadian production to be refined in refineries on the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, to be really clear on this up front, this is replacing uh, production or supply that would otherwise come into the United States from uh, foreign sources. Uh, it is not incremental supply into the United States. And uh, from our perspective, it is an extension of the market in the United States for Canadian production of crude oil. So you use the word foreign there in a way that Henry Waxman didn't. You don't consider Canadian foreign? Uh, we, we and most in the U.S. Uh, would not characterize Canadian oil as foreign oil in the context of the U.S. market. Okay, the lack of a pipeline, some people would observe, has not stopped Alberta from selling large quantities of oil to the United States in the past. So why would this project be so important at this time? Well, it's important at this time because production is growing from the oil sands. And uh, with that production growth, there's a need to access new markets. <clears throat> Uh, the U.S. Gulf Coast market is a new market in that context for Canadian crude oil. Uh, there are alternative markets uh, elsewhere in the U.S. and Canada, uh, potentially off the west coast of, of Canada to Asian markets. But this is the project that the market has spoken for, if you will. Uh, it's been identified as the preferred market. Uh, the, certainly the customer in the United States wants the product. And there's an opportunity, as I said earlier, to expand access for Canadian producers into parts of the U.S. where Canadian supply uh, has not previously penetrated in a significant way. Okay, let me follow up with Keith. Uh, once again, using the flip side of the last argument, the absence of a pipeline has not stopped and will not stop the search for oil in the oil sands, tar sands, call them what you will. So why is it important to you that this project be stopped? Well, there's people are opposing this project for a whole series of reasons, some of them very local, based on the water concerns. Um, but for us, one of the big issues is the climate change impact and the fact that if, this is basically a big investment in deepening our addiction to oil. We have no plan in this country for dealing with climate change, for moving off of fossil fuels, and this is something which is just going to help sort of keep that addiction going. We need to actually make big investments in energy efficiency, in renewable energy, start moving in a different direction. So and if we build this, this pipeline, thing, we're, we're going to continue our addiction? Is that the idea? And it's also about enabling the expansion of production from the tar sands. They're looking at doubling or tripling it over the next 10 to 15 years. If we do that, there's no way we can actually meet any of our climate change goals. Okay, Chris, let me bring you in at this point. Your organization is part of the AF of LCIO, a uh, long-standing, of course, labor organization going back many, many decades. Why is this project so important to the people you represent? Uh, the project is a game changer in our view. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a, uh, a mega project, if you will, that secures the work uh, for our members in Alberta and across Canada for uh, the next number of decades. This pipeline means skilled trades workers from every corner of the country, your plumbers and pipe fitters, your steam fitters, your carpenters, you name it, uh, can go to Alberta, uh, uh, earn a decent living, and then go back to where they're from. Th uh, this project is important because it solidifies uh, the employment prospects for those folks for the next number of years. Um, the the producers in Alberta, when they're filling this pipeline, will be expanding. They'll be maintaining their current facilities. And all of those things mean direct jobs for Canadians from everywhere. So if this That's Keystone why we stand XL, the pipeline. if the Keystone XL right. is shut down or for whatever reason is not allowed to proceed, what are the ramifications for the people you represent? Well, the ramifications are significant if it means a decrease in production uh, in the oil sands in Alberta. Uh, close to 40% of our national membership, we're about 500,000 folks, um, 35 to 40% of our national membership is actively engaged in oil and gas. And so this is a big job creator. If it doesn't proceed, I, 
I, I would argue, and I would say that uh, the future expansion of of, uh, of these great job creators are, uh, are are in question in the province of Alberta. Okay, having laid out the competing visions for what's at stake here, now we bring in Jeffrey Simpson to put the whole thing into context. Jeffrey, why is this such a big story? <laughs> Well, the jobs are very considerable. The money that Alberta oil producers can make is considerable. The profits they make will be very large. The uh, impact on U.S. oil supplies will be considerable. What the U.S. is looking for, I think we should explain this process, is that the uh, State Department under the United States, because uh, notwithstanding what my friend David says, Canada is considered a foreign country, has the obligation under U.S. law to consider whether this is in the national interest of the United States. And that's why the matter is with the State Department, although other agencies such, in the, such as the Environmental Protection Agency have things to say about it. That's why it's in the hands of the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and ultimately will be in the hands of the President. And at the end of this year, the State Department is required to issue a ruling on whether it's in the national interest of the United States. My own view, and this is conjecture more than anything else, is that they will rule in favor of Keystone on the grounds of national security, i.e. that Canada is considered to be a better and more secure source of additional oil than perhaps some other places. Uh, that will overrule the objections, and there have been many, both local and national, on environmental grounds. And they break down, I would say, into two or three categories. The first, which our friend from Greenpeace just expressed, is they don't like any expansion of fossil fuels, period. They want a remaking of the energy matrix in North America. There's a second group that says the oil sands, tar sands, whatever you want to call them, are actually more producers of greenhouse gas emissions than conventional oil. That's what the Royal Society of Canada, which is the most authoritative group in these matters, says. And that's an objection that people have in the United States. The third group are more local objections, although powerful, in the sense that there's a vast aquifer that sits under the American Midwest over which this pipeline would go. And there are some who claim that the pipeline would imperil were there to be a leak that exceptionally valuable aquifer. You see, that's why we have this guy on the program. He summed the whole thing up very nicely there. David, I do want to follow up on... I didn't take on... a position, though. <laughs> I understand that, but you gave us the context, which is what I asked for. Uh, David, I want to follow up with you, though. Uh, we heard Jeffrey refer to the national security angle here. Is it, you know, when we think of national security nowadays, we tend to think of terrorism, we, you know, all of that kind of stuff. We're talking about oil here. Is this really an argument of national security? Oh, I, I think it's, I, just to follow up on Jeff's comment, I, th I think it is very important to distinguish the discussion around whether this pipeline is in the national interest from the discussion, the much broader discussion about where hydrocarbons fit in the energy mix. Uh, the national interest determination in the United States requires three things. It looks at environmental factors, it looks at uh, economic factors, and it looks at national security. And just to be really clear, the environmental impact statement has been done, this project's been assessed backwards and forwards, and the environmental impact statement that's been completed for the project says it will not have any significant negative environmental impact. On economic grounds, Chris has already talked to the, uh, the employment benefits, the economic benefits that are derived from this project. From a national security standpoint, if I'm in the United States looking at where I secure my oil supply, and I have a choice between Canada uh, Mexico, Venezuela, the Middle East, you pick them, you pick another one. Uh, I think the answer is pretty clear that uh, building additional infrastructure to secure supply from Canada into U.S. markets is going to enhance national security and energy security in the U.S. And I think in many respects they're synonymous. So when you roll all those together, I think, I think actually the decision on the project is quite clear. Is there a legitimate debate over and above that around where hydrocarbons fit in the energy mix? climate policy, et cetera, et cetera, I'd agree that that's a discussion we ought to have, but we ought to have that discussion quite separately from this, this specific question as to whether Keystone should be built. And David, you're comfortable sitting here on this program tonight saying there will be no significant environmental after effects as a result of this project? Well, I, I, I believe that personally, but my, my opinion, I think, pales in comparison to the uh, extensive review the project's had through the environmental impact process, assessment process in the United States, this project, this pipeline's been more thoroughly examined than I think any other pipeline that's probably been built in North America. And the conclusion of the experts that have looked at it is exactly that. It will have no significant uh, negative environmental impact. That's Keith? the recommendation that's been brought forward. 
That is the basis for the review that's being conducted by the State Department. Keith, that's a lot of firepower there. Why should we not believe them and believe Greenpeace? Um, well, I don't think you should just take Greenpeace's word for it. If you look at the Environmental Protection Agency's comments on the Environmental Impact Assessment, they were not impressed. They kept sending it back saying not good enough. They kept saying we should look at things like what is the impact on greenhouse gas emissions from the expansion of the tar sands upstream. They had significant concerns over how it was done. We've also learned in recent days the New York Times came out with a piece this week uh, which pointed out that the company that was hired to do the environmental impact assessment is actually lists, you know, as one and was picked by TransCanada, the company building the pipeline, to do that for them also lists elsewhere the fact that one of their major clients is TransCanada. And you had you know, professors in the US saying, you know, this is inappropriate. You shouldn't have the environmental impact assessment being done with someone who has that close ties to the person who's trying to get it approved because they do business for them. And when you know, if you are hiring a consultant who works for you a lot, they're going to try and give you an answer that you want. And that's one of the reasons I think that the environmental protection agency in the US was dissatisfied with this. And one of the reasons it's going to end up on President Obama's desk is a difficult decision is he's got the EPA saying, uh-uh. And he's got the State Department where you have, in turn, including emails which have been released, where they've been cheering on TransCanada, saying, you know, way to go, Paul. Because it's the person who had the file in the State Department used to work on Hillary Clinton's campaign with the lead lobbyist for TransCanada. OK, let me get Jeffrey Simpson again to put some of this in context. We've got competing organizations within the United States government giving us competing advice here on this. Whom do we believe? Uh, well, it's America. <laughs> it's a decentralized system of government. So the State Department, as uh, David correctly said, had issued a series of statements about the uh, environmental impact that were positive, and the Environmental Protection Agency had volleyed them back, saying, not good enough, you didn't study this, you didn't study that. Um, I think ultimately, I'm sorry to be simplistic about this, at the end of the day, the president is going to make a, a kind of overarching political decision. And I don't mean that in a Republican-Democrat sense. I, I, I mean, there are de Republicans who, in Nebraska who oppose this pipeline, and there are Democrats who strongly support it. So uh, this issue transcends uh, the normal politics in the United States. I think he's going to have to weigh, what will this do to my standing? Remember. <laughs> Remember, everything now revolves around the U.S. presidential election. I'm sorry to be simplistic about this. And he's going to have to weigh, on the one hand, folks like Chris in the United States who say, we need, Mr. President, these jobs and we need them now. And he's going to have to assess the national security implications of oil from a foreign country called Canada as opposed to a foreign country like Mexico or Venezuela. It's all fine and dandy to say that we need more renewable resources. They're not going to happen anytime soon. But if I approve this, all the environmental groups that worked so hard for my last election campaign, and they did, are going to be mightily disappointed because they have identified this issue, rightly or wrongly, as a litmus test of his commitment to the environment. So at the end of the day, he's going to sit and make this kind of macro political judgment. And one important consideration, not the only one, is going to be What's the effect on my re-election campaign? Jeffrey, how about the micro uh, evaluation, which is this pipeline is going to go through a bunch of states that are red states, that he's probably not got a shot of winning. Do you think that's part I, of the I equation? Don't think that's, I don't think so. <laughs> Barack Obama is not going to carry Nebraska and Kansas. And frankly, they don't have enough electoral college uh, votes to make much of a difference. No, he's concerned about the money that went into his campaign from the West Coast, from the Henry Waxman crowd. He represents a district in Los Angeles, in fact, Beverly Hills. They're enormous contributors to the Democratic Party. The New York silk stocking elites, the environmentalists in Boston, that's where he would be concerned. But let me be a little bit less uh, perhaps political or cynical, if you like, and say there are important national security questions here. And there are very important environmental questions. So I think it's going to be a mix of the substantive and the political. I just say one thing. I take slight issue with my friend David when he says, let's disaggregate this issue from the bigger question of climate change. I don't think you can do that. If we do that with every single project, then we're never going to actually make any progress on climate change because it's always going to be pushed off into the abstract tomorrow. Each of these issues, each of these problems does have to be considered in terms of its impact on the environment 
although as we just heard from the Commissioner of Sustainable Development in Canada, the plan of our government is manifestly and grossly inadequate to meet the targets it has set. Hmm. Chris, let me get you to uh, react to a new issue that I'm going to put on the table here, a bit of a different wrinkle on this. Uh, here's a okay. quote taken from the pages of uh, Jeffrey Simpson's newspaper, The Globe and Mail, from last month. Okay. This is from Brian okay. Topp, who, as you know, is running for the leadership of the NDP today, and who knows, maybe calling you up for an endorsement one of these days. He said, in promoting Perhaps. and facilitating this project, the Harper government is once again scripting Canada in the world economy to be a source of raw, unprocessed resources. Tommy Douglas used to rail against this in the 1940s. Then, why are we exporting raw logs when we could be exporting furniture? Now, why are we exporting raw bitumen when we could be exporting the hundreds of products that are derived from our own petrochemicals? Okay, question for you. This is not a new argument, obviously. Tommy Douglas, the former CCF NDP leader, made it decades ago. Uh, right. You know, we are refining oil ourselves instead of shipping the raw products south, or we should be doing that, is his argument, and that would create more jobs. So you got a point? Right. Um, the debate is one of having a long-term view for the Canadian market as part of the North American uh, energy market. So if you have a number of oil sands owners at the table and one of those owners uh, has refining capacity or upgrading capacity in another jurisdiction um, at the current time and the, the, there isn't refining capacity currently in Alberta or any other Canadian jurisdiction, uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that that uh, product is going to move to where that oil sands partner has refining capacity. So it's part and parcel of the development of our energy uh, system. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, criticize comments that have been made uh, by, by Mr. Top, but what I would say is that in the long-term view, uh, this will create Canadian jobs. Uh, there will be uh, new upgraders built in Alberta because of this. There's four sort of on the docket right now, and maybe uh, I, I'd let Mr. Collier talk about those. I wouldn't want to uh, get the information wrong. Well, let me but get those him are in on game that. Okay, David Collier, yeah. come on in on that. I mean, if, the, if there's four on the books, I guess Brian Topp's position would be, you know, maybe we should have eight, and uh, we should be doing the work here and getting the jobs here rather than shipping this raw product south. Uh, let me let me comment quickly on that, and then I'd just like to come back to a couple of the comments we made previously, if you don't mind. Uh, on the on the question of where bitumen is upgraded, let's be clear up front that about two thirds, just under two thirds, of the bitumen that is produced in Canada is currently upgraded in Canada. So there's a significant amount of bitumen upgrading already taking place in this country. The amount of bitumen upgraded will continue to increase uh, as more projects come on and there's increased production. So we are going to see, in fact an increase in absolute terms in the amount of bitumen that's upgraded in Canada and that will create jobs as a result. Uh, there will not be the, the potential, I don't believe, to upgrade all of that bitumen in Canada for two reasons. Uh, one, frankly, is the economics don't support it. It's uh, more economic to uh, utilize existing refinery capacity that's available in the United States rather than build new facilities in some cases. And that will move some product to the United States to be upgraded. And second, frankly, we've got, a, we've got a significant challenge in terms of the amount of labor availability to actually develop all of the projects that are on the drawing boards. So, uh, you know, so I don't think we ought to be saying you know, in a market-oriented economy where free trade actually has worked very well for this country that we ought to force all of that to happen in, in Canada. There will be increases in upgrading capacity in this country. Some of the product will go to the U.S. to be upgraded. If I could come back very quickly just to a couple of the previous comments that were made. I think we need to be clear that the decision only ends up on the president's desk if one of the other agencies cannot support the State Department's decision. The EPA has had an opportunity to comment uh, more than once on the State Department's assessment of the project. The State Department has tried to address the EPA's concerns in the environmental impact statement and that yet process is yet to be played out. So it is possible this ends up on the president's desk and frankly I think the environmental community would like it to end up there because they know that the project, they will not get their way on the merits of the project and they would like to turn it into a political decision. We'll see how that unfolds. Second, to Jeffrey's comment, uh, and I, I take your point, Jeffrey, that, uh, you know, that you can't completely separate this issue. My point is only this, that the United States will use oil for quite a long time to come from somewhere. If this project is not built, if Keystone doesn't get built, if that supply doesn't come from Canada, then it will come from somewhere else. Jeffrey, second, want to come back there's on that? Lots of there's, there's lots of opportunity for the United States to reduce its dependence on oil 
Canadian or otherwise, and still increase the amount of volume that's coming from Canada. Okay, let me give Jeffrey a chance to uh, come back on any of that if he wants to. I agree completely that the United States is going to remain, and this is George Bush's word, not mine, addicted to oil, all right? And, and for the foreseeable future, whatever the efforts are made for uh, renewable energies. Uh, so they're going to be a major, major world energy uh, importer. Now, it, it's interesting that in recent years, U.S. energy domestic production has gone up and consumption has somewhat gone down because of the recession. And indeed, in uh, the Congressional Budget Office of the United States recent report, they predicted that actually the supply and energy would be rather, f uh, sorry, of oil would be rather flat for the foreseeable future. It is possible, therefore, that the share of Canadian oil going into the United States is going to go up. Um, the uh, decision they have to make is, um, can we uh, believe that from Venezuela, uh, which has a very um, uh, undesirable regime at the moment, but that regime might change to a more favorable one, uh, are we less advantaged uh, by relying on Mexico or Venezuela? or our partners in the Gulf, for example, as, uh, as opposed to Canada. And that's a kind of political judgment that you have to make. Uh, some people, not David, I'm happy to say, but some people have advanced the argument, sort of right-wing fringe types, that uh, this Canadian oil is ethical oil. And this is a complete perversion of the study of ethics, which is the study of morals, which is the study of the good. Uh, that would be the first time in the history of Canada, and this argument has been adopted by the federal government of all places, that we compared ourselves favorably with thugocracies, autocracies, dictatorships, and like-minded regimes around the world and felt good about ourselves as a consequence. That's a really shameful kind of argument. Jeffrey, I, I, I hate to tell you, you're off Ezra Levant's Christmas card list right now. I know that will uh, come as a great shock and sadness to you. Well, no, what, I'm really off Peter Kent. He's the federal <laughs> environment minister. <laughs> within 48 yeah. hours of him becoming the minister, he was aping these right-wing fringe groups. Steve, Can I actually make a comment? I, sure. Let's get uh, let's get Chris in and then Keith. Sure. I, I, I guess when we're talking about uh, um, ethical oil, we're talking about that, those sorts of things. I, I, I don't want to get into that. But what I do want to say is that in Canada, don't we want, or in North America, wouldn't we want our products uh, where we know where the product has come from? So when uh, people have gone to work. Uh, we know the health and safety standards associated with those jobs. We know the principles that are uh, uh, sort of amongst all of us in, in terms of our democracy. We know that uh, the, the, the producers in Alberta are operating in a way which can be monitored or regulated, and the people that go to work for them every day are doing so uh, uh, sort of by choice, and uh, that's their profession. Can't we, don't we feel better as a North American society that we're providing product to uh, another North American society uh, and then we're all using the end product? So uh, ethical oil or non-ethical oil, but it's North American product and we, should, we, we shouldn't be ashamed that Canada is uh, uh, extracting our resources and, and moving forward with our economy. It's something we've done since uh, the beginning of our confederation. Chris, what if it contributes to the end of the planet? Still feel the same way? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What if what you're talking about is contributing to the end of our planet as we know it? Would you feel the same way? Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to predict the end of the planet on today's show, but I, the, 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 the important thing about our country is that we take a balanced approach to things. We, we have to take a measured approach, a balanced approach, and a responsible approach. And I think, you know, the way we have it set up in this country is uh, for strong regulation or the ability to promote strong regulation, um, and then sort of the responsible development of our resources. We're, we're different than places where uh, uh, they're not blessed with, with, uh, with a strong democracy and, and, and strong, uh, strong groups like all of us in this, in, in this discussion. That, that can talk about these issues. Okay, Keith. So, so I wouldn't want to say it's the end of our planet. I'm not sure. I understand. But Keith, hang on. I've got to have yeah. Keith for a turn here. Um, so I think one of the big choices, we, we know that demand for oil in North America is going down. Um, that's everyone from Exxon to the International Energy Agency says that. Um, when we look at the investments we're going to make today, I think we have to think about, are they helping accelerate that transition off of oil and onto renewables? And in the short term, that's mostly going to be through energy efficiency and then later through renewable energy. Or are we going to invest billions upon billions of dollars in 
expanding that fossil fuel economy. And I think if you look at what's the right thing to do for future generations, it's to accelerate like crazy on that shift. And this decision is sort of part of that. I, I completely agree with Jeffrey Simpson that you can't actually separate these types of decisions out from that broader perspective on energy. And if, we are, if we're going to be honest with ourselves about what it's going to take to deal with climate change, it means saying no to projects like this and saying yes. Even if yes, the market demands it. Markets respond, are shaped by governments, shaped by people's behavior. And I'd just like to point out that you know, in the Ontario election, Greenpeace was out defending the Green Energy Act. Not any particular party, but that Green Energy Act. And we did a bunch of photo ops around and sort of did a bunch of releases and those type of things. But it was interesting. Like one of the photo ops we did was down in Windsor. It was jointly with the CEO and the owner of this, that solar industry company with the Canadian auto workers and Greenpeace. And the funny thing was my colleague who was in talking to the CEO just before they all went out and did the little photo op, I mean, on his wall was a big picture of Ronald Reagan. Um, <laughs> who was it, your favorite president, of course. <laughs> um, and, but it's, like, it's interesting because I think like, the truly conservative thing to do would be to actually try and conserve our future and not seek to radically destabilize the climate, which is pretty much the path we're on. So I really think that when we're looking at these individual projects, you absolutely have to think about what kind of an energy system are we building. And there are more jobs, I think, in saving the planet than in wrecking it. Okay, let me go to David on this one. You said something during the course of your last answer that I wanted to follow up on, and that is you said, if you take this on the merits, it's a slam dunk for your side. But if you get politics involved and it ends up somehow on the president's desk, that will somehow, uh, maybe I'm reading between the lines here, but the inference I took was that that somehow would pervert the process and get you the wrong decision. Are you so sure that the merits are on your side and that politics, the only involvement in politics for this is to um, kind of take a, an unfair shot at, at what ought to be the outcome in your view? Well, I think the merits of the case speak for themselves. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt about what the outcome should be. I, I frankly don't think there's a whole lot of doubt about what the president's decision would be either. Uh, my only point earlier was that the environmental community, I think, is trying very hard to get this on the president's desk so that they have some shot at the outcome they're seeking because they realize that the process uh, and the, the project on its merits uh, will, get, will get its approval. Uh, but I think more fundamental to this, this discussion is the question of... You know, I, what I find in the environmental community and the, the points been made in this discussion, it's, it's always a binary decision. You can have more oil, you can have something else, but you can't have both. And you know, our view is, look, the United, the United States, North America are going to use a lot of oil for a long time to come. Better that oil be supplied from Canada than from somewhere else, because it will be supplied from somewhere else. That does not preclude in any way uh, development of renewable energy sources. They are going to grow. Uh, there's some significant market challenges, market realities that I think are going to impact the pace of that growth and, and that often don't get talked about, but the, the, you know, the market has spoken in terms of the pace at which uh, those energy sources are penetrating the market. The Ontario government has made some choices about subsidizing renewables and increasing the pace at which they penetrate. Other governments may choose to do the same. That's their prerogative. Uh, but I would simply make the point that the United States is going to use a lot of oil We'd like it to come from Canada. I believe they would too. Uh, and increasing the supply from Canada does not in any way preclude the opportunity for the United States or Canadians to conserve energy, to develop renewables either through market forces or through government intervention should they choose to do so. And there's lots of room in the energy mix of the United States for there both to be increases in supply of crude oil from Canada and growth in renewables. And how do you get there? You get there by reducing imports from foreign sources um, that would otherwise come into the United States over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Okay, let me uh, read something from the Global Mail I don't Mail think here. they're at all uh, inconsistent with one another. Let me read, uh, this is uh, Jeffrey from your newspaper, Globe and Mail editorial from last month. It goes like this. Environmentalists are right to be concerned about the overall increase in emissions that comes from oil, but a large share of that comes not from the oil sands directly, but from the transportation sector, from the vehicles that burn fuels refined from oil sands bitumen. The activists could instead advocate a quicker development of electric car infrastructure or better cross-border policies that would reduce emissions across a number of sectors. Uh, would your advice, Jeffrey, and I know and I, I shouldn't have put it that way because I know you're going to tell me you're a columnist, you're not in the advice-giving business. So let me rephrase. What do you think about the notion that environmentalists ought to hold their fire uh, for what your editorial really pointed to? Uh, you know, promote the electric car and let these projects kind of take their natural course as the market demands. 
So if you're serious about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you try to move on a wide range of fronts because there is no one particular source. The tar sands or oil sands are responsible for about 5% of the uh, nation's emissions. They're growing as a share as production increases. But clearly the transportation sector, the electrical generation sector, the residential construction sector, all of these sectors have to become involved because each makes a contribution. In the area of automobiles, uh, Canada and the United States have agreed to significantly improved emission standards for vehicles as they're produced down the road. The major automobile companies are, in fact, they're coming on the market, I believe, next year if they're not already on the market, with the first electric cars or hybrids or whatever. So I mean, a lot of progress is being made in that area. The challenge that, I don't know the challenge, the observation I would make is this. There are folks in Greenpeace is one that sees this as part of a bigger fight against the use of fossil fuels and the expansion of fossil fuels. But there's another angle. And Steve, I'd just like to read this. It comes from today's papers. And it is a memo that was sent by Mr. Mark LePage to our ambassador in Washington. Mr. LePage is a special advisor on climate change. And he wrote this. The anti-oil sands campaign is very real and shows no sign of letting up. This will not go away and will likely intensify in the absence of movement on climate change legislation here in Canada. Now, mm -hmm. look, the European Parliament has made a proposal, we'll see whether it gets adopted, to list the oil from the oil sands in a negative way in the uh, European Union. We have this fight over key Keystone. In Europe, the oil sands, tar sands, have become the number one target for environmentalists when they look at what's going on in Canada and in the petroleum industry. Unless and until the oil sands group in Alberta gets a better grip on emissions and realizes that the production, for especially the in situ production, is producing more greenhouse gas emissions per unit of electricity, according to the Royal Society of Canada and just about everyone else, then they're going to continue to be hectored and harried at every turn, not just by Greenpeace and hardline environmentalists, but by others who have a genuine concern about the production of greenhouse gases and the climate change challenge that that produces. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, and Keith, let me start with you and see if we can get one more thing on the table here. At the end of the day, we all know what the economy is like in North America right now. Fragile would be putting it generously. Does the promise of more jobs and more economic activity regardless of environmental impact, trump everything right now? I would say no, because we have to spend a lot of money on our energy infrastructure to update it, to renew it. We could invest that in greener forms or in fossil fuels. Either way, you're going to create a lot of jobs. Um, so it's not actually jobs versus the environment. If we actually want to have a healthy economy in the future, we actually have to have a greener economy. So let's start building those green jobs rather than continuing down that older path. Chris, what do you say on that? I say we have a carbon-based economy, and I think slowly we are making a shift uh, in this country. Uh, we're doing things like incenting windmills and solar panels. However, currently, and for the last number of years and for the foreseeable years, the real jobs and the real impact on uh, people is in a carbon-based economy. Uh, for example, Ontario has a population of 13 odd million. Alberta has a population of around four. Um, Alberta is uh, currently training about the same number of apprentices that the entire province of Ontario is doing. So we have to decide what the policy levers are we want to pull when we're investing uh, in, in our energy future. Is it training young people? Is it creating a system of mobility for, for a workforce? So I don't think the environment trumps jobs or jobs trump the environment. I think it can be done in a way which respects both. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think industry and industry stakeholders are doing a better job than before at, at moving along that continuum. Let me get David on that. W would it be your view, though, David, that given the economic climate we find ourselves in now, uh, you are uniquely positioned to be making the jobs versus the environment argument? Well, I think we're uniquely positioned to create jobs and economic growth in the country. And frankly, I think the oil and gas industry is probably the key economic driver in the country right now. But let me, let me just be very explicit. That is not at the expense of the environment. Uh, you know, we're, we are very supportive of energy conservation. In fact, you know, that is a, a core part of what we do in terms of reducing energy use and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, 
we have po spoken publicly about uh, support for a broader carbon policy in Canada. Uh, that has not been forthcoming to this point. The government's indicated its intention to regulate rather than put a broader carbon policy in place. Uh, I, I can go through quite a number of areas where we believe we are operating very responsibly from an environmental standpoint. Okay, well, tell me this, David. So, are so you this in favor is, this of... This is about how Hang we on a sec. I, I, literally, I'm down to my last minute and a half here, so I want to make sure I get you on the record on this. What's your view on whether people should buy electric cars? Well, I, I think fundamentally the issue comes down to whether they're attractive to the consumer. Um, you know, I, I think what gets lost in this oftentimes, and Greenpeace has said it again in this, in this conversation, is that the market, investors make decisions about where capital moves. Investors have spoken. They're, they're investing in the oil sands. They're not investing to the degree that some would like in the renewable sector. And, and that is because the market does not support that investment. So governments can choose to intervene. Consumers can choose to intervene in terms of what they would want to buy and not buy. But I think, frankly, the evidence speaks for itself. But if everybody wanted to buy an electric car tomorrow, you guys would be in deep doo-doo, wouldn't you? Well, we would. But you know, if, if that's what the market, if that's how that's how the market works, then uh, we'll have to adapt to that. I guess the point the I would make is, is that at, at this stage, the market's not uh, certainly not supporting those kinds of investment decisions. Jeffrey, got 20 seconds the, if you the, want it. The problem is the market is imperfect because it doesn't capture the cost of pollution. If you internalize the cost of fossil fuel producers, uh, pollution with the producers through a carbon tax then the playing field between renewables and fossil fuels would be somewhat, I emphasize somewhat, more level. Jeffrey Simpson from the Globe and Mail gets the last word. Chris Smiley's beside him from the Canadian Building Trades. Thanks for being there for us in our Ottawa Bureau. David Collier from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Keith Stewart, Greenpeace Canada, here in our Toronto studios. Thanks so much, everybody.